Thank you. Thank you, brethren. Thank you, Meroni. Please confirm if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, can, can the other brethren hear me as well? Am I clear? Yes, you yes, are clear. Yes, I can hear you. Amen. Praise the Lord, brethren. Amen. 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 Um, I count it a blessed moment, joy this evening to be part of this fellowship this evening in this space and especially to be challenged, to be given the opportunity to share the word of God. Engineer Richard Mugisa are my names. I'm a civil engineer. I'm trying to put my face to the, the, the voice. And I work in the electricity transmission company. And uh, most of the time I'm up country because we are extending the grid. I'm in, in charge of extending high voltage power from Mirama in Intungamo to Kabale in West Athens and Uganda. So most of the time, that is where I am, and that's my workstation. But maybe most familiar to us all, I'm privileged to be part of uh, the work of God at SCP, uh, to bring the house of God in physical terms to completion in this season. Amen. I am married to uh, Lois Mugisa, um, and together, the Lord has blessed us with three children who are all in high school and university. So we have a lonely house back home these days. Uh, probably a chance to get to know each other more and to get to know the Lord more in this season when the children have gone. And we stay on Gaza Road in a place called Masoli, uh, pretty much opposite Canon Jole Babilkam Magire area, the opposite side. I do thank God for the reason and this season to seek his face since they have begun. I must thank you all, brethren, for keeping the fire burning at the altar. And I do believe that this Lent season or the fasting season, which has come from one season to another, and more specifically, the just concluded prayer conference, which I missed because I was away at my workstation. I pray that our levels of faith and commitment to the Lord have also grown tremendously. Um, and we are grateful to all God's servants that keep ministering to us and have been ministering to us throughout this season. I'm not shy to thank the cathedral leadership, especially Reverend Hiri Jaffo. I sent him a message before this fellowship began. I said, Reverend, I thought you were joking. I did not know that you had put me on this schedule because it's my first time to share the word of God. So I kept thinking he has sent to me a schedule erroneously because we share a lot of information on the project. So I thought I did open it for a long time, Reverend. That's why I didn't even respond to you for a long time because I kept thinking, no, no, this is not for me. So I, I can't take it for granted at all, Reverend. Thank you for um, challenging me. I don't take it for granted to be part of this ministry schedule. And I want to thank God. I'm, I'm encouraged by his grace, his words, when he said, God knows how to choose a nobody and makes him a somebody without consulting anybody. Just today, Apostle Victor in, in the cathedral said, God will, can make the non-qualified to be qualified in God's house. And so I stand in faith. I stand in that strength of the Lord to know that I'm in the right place. And I know that the Lord will bless us this evening. Let me, I grew up in the revival fellowship where we testified and shared our lives with brethren uh, openly to know each other and walk together and stand together. So let me, I it could be for either for the first time or very rare occasion, give you a brief of my salvation testimony Then I can share on the, on this, on the subject. So that then you can put this engineer who is this, uh, standing on concrete and buildings all the time, you can put a face that by, by the grace of God uh, that uh, I can be amongst us. I was born to very young parents, very young, 17, 18. 
uh, who separated quickly. And my father shortly passed on at the age of 30. And so I was raised by my mother who sacrificed all that she had for me. And I grew up at my grandfather's place, which is her home in a village of grandchildren. I'm saying a village of grandchildren. I hope you understand what that means. My grandfather was a civil servant of the time as a roads inspector. So perhaps engineering came from there. Uh, but at the same time, he was the catechist of our village church. He was an influential opinion leader in the area. But can you imagine running a bar business at the same time? A polygamous man, and therefore obviously not born again at the time. So whenever my grandfather, who is our catechist of the village, would be suffering from great hangover from alcohol, then I, at the tender age, would take over the church leadership since we were familiar with the liturgy then, uh, even as an infant. Uh, interestingly, I taught so many people to be ready for baptism and confirmation, even when I was not baptized myself. At the age of 10, by the grace of God, I received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Age of 10, through Life Ministry Jesus Film Project in 1982, uh, which dramatized what I had been teaching people, confirmants and the people going to baptism. So it played it back to me graphically. And the message went to my spirit and I found Christ. I thank God for that day. First of August, 1982. I was then taught the revival way of Christian life. I'm saying the revival way in terms of fashion of life, how we fashion our lives, our lives and how we live in genuine repentance, walking in light and restitution, in fellowship and participated in ministry rooted in sincere love without room for hypocrisy, without room for hypocrisy. I actually struggle with brethren who strive, who th thrive in blackmail of others whose Christian lives is like acting a movie. Because I was, I remember one day, my mother punching me for hypocrisy. So the Lord taught me not to live in hypocrisy. So by the grace of God, and for the past 41 years or so, I've been committed in my life to serve the Lord in various capacities and opportunities when given. Life ministry for discipleship, in the scripture union, for evangelistic missions. I was part of the SU band that rocked this country for the 90s and 2000s in schools as a musician, therefore, back home in my home diocese as a youth worker at the cathedral and family life, uh, friends of the clergy back home in our diocese, raising various disadvantaged children in my home. Many of the girls are now married and most familiar to us now as a professional at SCP now. But however long this spiritual journey can be counted by years or by experience, I'm still a work in progress, brethren. I'm in need of continuous revival for spiritual growth, no doubt about it. And my life being like a house of God, the theme of our, this evening, in which God does and should dwell. So pray with me as we share this evening that I myself will also experience the grace of God this evening to make my house better as a house of God. First things first, what is God's house? One would ask. The theme is God's house. My, the, my, my house shall be called the house of prayer. So God's house, house of prayer. One could say God's house is simply a building in which God's presence is revered and experienced. The sacred setting, I, uh, you, the way you walk in the cathedral is not the way you walk in my living room. Sacred space, one could say that. Uh, and I think the obvious word that is used to describe this is temple. Carrying the thinning of a sacred building at a specific location with a specific code of behavior. And that's why I think why we have some traditions. We follow, have a governed, um, um, lifestyle together with the unique architecture certain things we i look out for at scps 
the architecture of the church is different from the, the architecture of any building. It's uniqueness to give glory to God and identifiable with God's character and creating experience of awesomeness in the presence of God. So one could say that in terms of describing a temple. But uh, on the other hand, if you just plainly describe the house, it then is just a fit for purpose building where we all can all live, where we have a life fashioned around our functional needs. Uh, and, and we don't have necessarily traditions there. But the, the, the thing about the house is creates an experience of life in that building. And so let me take us through our text, Matthew, open your Bibles, friends. Matthew 21, verse 12 to 13. Matthew chapter 21, where our, our topic comes from. Matthew chapter, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 13. Let me read it. I must also, I must also tell you that my wife is sitting with me in the room. She'll be able to hear if I'm telling the truth of anything I say, as it <laughs> she's part of this fellowship this evening. So Lois has sent you greetings. She has walked into the room as we share. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who brought and sold in the temple and overturned the temples of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, 13, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves of thieves. God forbid that this can be pure around us, but let's see what the Lord is saying to us. This passage it come, comes in at a time when Jesus has triumphantly entered Jerusalem, just after. I did not work out the timelines of how many days passed. Yes, but a few days later, I go to the temple straight. He has come to, Jesus has come to Jerusalem for the last journey towards the cross, Jesus is aware that his earthly ministry will soon end once he offers the sacrificial death on the cross for us and for our redemption as humankind. And his immediate attention is to go to the temple and to cleanse it. Lesson number one I pick is our appetite, friends, for cleansing should be high always whether as an individual or a fellowship or a church in terms of institutional setting as a church. But friends, what I see Jesus doing here, he has arrived in Jerusalem before lots of entanglement straight to the temple and to cleanse it. I pray this evening that our appetite to be cleansed, our appetite for cleansing will be high will always be high, will always be prompt. And then Jesus publicly cleanses the temple on two accounts in the Gospels. The first one is at the beginning of his ministry in chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. In John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, I found a, 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 a bit of text I'd never taken note of, that there Jesus even used a whip of cords, chiboku, to cleanse the temple and drive out these merchandise people. Jesus used even a whip of cords. And now the text we're reading today is the one towards the end of his ministry. Do you sense uh, that throughout Jesus' ministry at the beginning and at the end, it's characterized by cleansing. And in both cases, Jesus is driving out those engaged in commercial business. 
Lesson number two, friends, these earthly things, these material things, these commercial things, the things that consume us daily, although we need them for earthly life. But these things that we even sometimes carry into God's house for earthly gain or earthly glory, they often defile us from within, from the divine call, to use God's house for his purpose. May the Lord have mercy on us that we are not carried away by these earthly things, though necessary for earthly life, but that then they take over God's call, God's purpose in God's house. That's a point for us to watch out, a point to pray for our leadership, even in terms of the institutional church, that will be focused on God's purpose in our lives and not be carried away by these things of material or earthly, although we need them for the life of earthly life. While cleansing the temple, Jesus chooses to refer to this building, now no longer just as the temple, but the house of prayer. There is a sense of purpose the Lord Jesus proclaims. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Jesus is moving us away from the sacred temple character to the real value, to the real worth of that space where his presence is, the house of prayer. Fit for purpose, a lifestyle based to that. So may the Lord give us uh, grace to live to that as, 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 as the Lord cleanses us day to day. If we have time, I want to refer to a related text in First Corinthians. We will not read it, but kindly write it down. And take time to read 1 Corinthians. The first, Paul's letter, the first to the first letter of the Corinthians, chapters one up to six, then the entire six chapters. St. Paul is writing to this Corinthian church, which is based in a booming city in terms of commercial business, because Corinth was a booming city for business connected to many ends, a hub of business. But this church tainted with divisions and intrigue among believers. Do you know any of that in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our Midwest? Divisions and intrigue among believers in the church, dragging each other to court. You identify that anywhere? Tainted with sexual immorality. Anybody knows about that in our Midwest? And he says, Tainted with abuse of spiritual gifts, the Corinthian church, community of believers challenged by pride and lack of sincere love in the body of Christ, one could say in the house of God. So St. Paul is responding. He's got this report about this church from one of the households. And see this lost opportunity. Corinth, being in a strategic location as a business hub, had the opportunity to pro propagate the gospel. So there's an opportunity the enemy is grabbing. Strategically located, is it All Saints Cathedral? Is it your fellowship? Is it your home? Is it your profession? Strategically located and yet tainted with those forces, division, intrigue, immorality, incest, abuse, of, and robbed of the opportunity to extend the kingdom of God, to extend the work of God in the house of God. And so Corinth was losing that opportunity. It's also possible that the diverse cultures that because it was a business hub would then bring in this pressure of uh, different um, cultures and immorality and idolatry and all the things that intrusion that interferes with the well-being of the child. That's another point of prayer. We need to pray that the Lord will help us to deal with intrusion that interferes with the well-being of the child, of the house of God. And I will at a later point show that even your life is a house of God. But I'll come to that. But the point I pick here, friends, that touched me in my heart is that, like Corinth, strategic Strategically located and yet losing an opportunity, we need to deal with intrusion that interferes with the well-being of the church. 
And so when you read those chapters, by the time you get to chapter six, there's a verse that we commonly know. In chapter three, verse 16 uh, to 17, there is a scripture there that says, do you not know? First Corinthians chapter three, verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And remember, we defined the house of God and said, there's a sense in which it's a temple, it's a house. So do you not know, friends, that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know? Do I not know, Richard? 17, if anyone defies the temple of God, if anyone defies the house of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Ah, it's getting closer to the individual. It's getting closer to you and me as an individual person. We're moving away from the corporate feeling and the building and the setting together as a house of God. This scripture begins to point to come closer and say, it is you, Melon, it's you, Richard. It is you, it's you, Joy. Do you not know? For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, a similar scripture is repeated. St. Paul repeats it in chapter 6, again, verse 18 and 19 and 20. It says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And then 19 says, all, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So certain, certain principles come up there. This one says, you are not your own. And the other one says, which temple you are. We're discussing the house of God, house of prayer. Friends, I get the challenge, the conviction that I am not my own. I belong to the Lord. And because of that, there are certain things that don't go my way. Do you not know that you're not your own? So, friends, going forward, I'm going to talk about this, taking into consideration you and me are, in a way, houses of God. Do you not know that you are? That our bodies are houses of God. So, there's a way that I'm going to take it on and keep looking at it as you, keep looking at it as myself, that I am the house of God. This God that we're talking about, before we go to Nakasero, before we go to the online church, I am the house of God as well. Let me illustrate a house, which many of us know. A house has many components, and I'm very sure you are familiar with this. A house has foundations. And the reason, and I think everyone here put me on this topic, knowing that the house, I'll understand the house perhaps. Let me talk about the house, Reverend Hillary. It is a subject area I understand well. A house has foundations. The reason we put foundations in the house is anchorage. So, do you not know, you child of God, you are the house of God, where is your anchor? Anchorage, what is your foundation? What is your foundation? Walls, we put out walls in a house when we've come out of the foundations for protection and then to dictate how we operate, to dictate, to dictate space, the utilization. And, and somewhere ahead, I'll talk about walls in the house of God. We put a roof, a roof on, on, on the house to cover against natural causes. Now I'm going to talk about the other which covers against unnatural ones. The roof is against unnatural cause, natural causes, uh, like hair rain and wind and dust, the roof covers us. But then we put doors and windows, these ones are for protect, protection, against intrusion. They are natural things. We have talked about dealing with intrusion, not to lose an opportunity to extend God's work amongst us. Like Corinth was losing a, a golden opportunity but when it was at strategically located. So doors and windows protect us against intrusion. Finishes, all these things we like that look nice, which we have finished tiles and paint. And the, those ones just give us a good experience in a house. Ambience and beauty. Then we put it furnishing, 
to live there and be comfortable. Friends, I've tried to describe the house quickly, which you're familiar with. And any house, I'm, I dare say, that's built by human hands, whichever engineer you will use, gets worn out as time passes and needs three things. Either renovation, which is routine or major, or remodeling, which means we want to improve the design to respond to emerging needs. We, we built a house, not knowing we'll get five pairs of twins, and suddenly we have 10 children. We've got to remodel to respond to that emerging need, remodeling. And sometimes it's a reconstruction. So any house that's built with by human hands will in its lifespan face any of those, either a renovation, a remodeling, or a reconstruction, a new phase altogether, a new design, a new purpose, new assignment. How is God's house in you? How is God's house in me? Is it in need of renovation? Are we due for remodeling? Are we a case for reconstruction? How is God's house in me? How is God's house in you? How's the house of prayer? Is prayer completely gone? We need to reconstruct the altar. We can. We need to identify that and grab this season of revival. Are the foundations safe or are they destroyed? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Prayer is surely one assurance. We have to redeem the cracked foundation. Prayer as an individual, that is my challenge. I'm traveling every time, so you pray. Uh, quickly, then, then you're on the journey all the time, then you're tired. Challenge prayer as a, as, as a family, either two, if you're married, past a couple, or two with your children. Prayer, how is it going? Do we need to reconstruct? Do we need to renovate? Do we need to remodel anything? May the Lord um, give us grace to build this house of prayer in us and at our homes and in our fellowship and church. Let me pick one more text as we, uh, time is going. Isaiah 56, Isaiah chapter 56. You will read the entire passage from verse one, probably up to verse eight. But I'll keep paraphrasing because of time I'll read, I'll not read all of it. Um, in the house of God, let me begin with verse five. I will give them in my house and within my walls. Do you remember me describing foundations, walls, roof? I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I'll give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. Friends, in the house of God, the Lord gives us a memorial and a name better than sons, daughters, this earthly heritage. And the beautiful thing is the name that will never be cut off. That it is in the house of God. May the Lord grant us the grace to experience this blessing. That we will be in the house of God and experience the memorial. The, the name that the Lord gives us that cannot be cut off, not just to be extinct. We have a purpose for which God, the Lord God has chosen you and me. God chose Israel that we read about in the word of God to be witness of his grace. And in this text, you can read it well and hold to be a witness of his grace and holiness. All people, and that temple we read about in Matthew chapter 21 in Jerusalem was to be house of prayer. Now there's a beautiful thing there that says for all nations, and that includes you and me. Back to Isaiah 56 and verse 6 and 7. Let me read them together. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord ministered to him. Love the name of Yahweh. 
and become his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without discrediting it, and all who hold firmly to my covenant, verse 7, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. Then it goes, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That is when I jumped up. I said, yes, even Hoima is there for all nations. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God brings foreigners, brings all sorts of people. And this represents the unity of brethren. Embraces us, subject to his authority. And our part is to bring sacred the Sabbath. You see, this text says, and they, shall, and they keep the Sabbath, and they do this. So our part is to bring sacrifices, praise, prayer, repentance, offering and giving. And the Lord would give us a name that will never be. But where is it happening? In the house of prayer for all nations. This morning when the servant of God, Apostle Victor, was talking, Oh, I got some takeaways. I hope you were there. Changing our story by our level of obedience. That was a good one. Changing our story by our level of obedience. And whatever Jesus says, do that. Whatever he says, do that. The only question here is to sort out what Jesus has said and what human beings have said. Sometimes there can be a problem. But may the Lord help us. But when we have known what Jesus has said, Friends, let's do that. Why? In obedience, we give give ourselves to God, into God's house, and to live for him and his service. And in the house of God, done qualified, become qualified by the grace of God. And so let us be in the house of God and let us house God. Let us house God. So the Lord brings all people from all nations my house. And none feels as an outcast because it's the Lord that has brought them in that house of prayer. So God gathers outcasts back to himself. Have you felt like an outcast somewhere before in your family, at work, or even in church? I plead with you, stay in church, stay in the house of God, and let there be prayer in that house. Who is you? Because we shared and said, you and me are the temple of God. Are you not aware that you are the one? Yes, you are. As I come to a close, friends, on this subject, God's house, a house of prayer, who is you and me, I have three suggestions as we close. Number one, I pray that we can maintain the purpose for which God's house was established, or is established in you and me. The purpose. When we design a house, as engineers, we, there is a purpose the owner of the house gives. And we have to follow and pursue that purpose in the design. And I pray that we can maintain the purpose for God's house in you, but also for God's house as a church, as an institution, as a family of God. And this is about two things. Communion with the Lord. My house shall be called the house of prayer. I pray and plead with us and we pray for our leadership that we can keep the main thing as the main thing, both as individuals and as an, as a church, that we can keep the main thing as the main thing, communion with God. And part B, which is also our role, is to keep the altar alive. To keep the altar alive with living sacrifices. When we were at university, Someone told us that the problem with living sacrifices is because they are alive, they walk away from the altar. I pray that uh, we will stay at the altar as sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 to 2 is known to us very well. I beseech you, or I urge you, in another version, brethren, by the masses of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. Another one says, which is proper worship, front worship. 
and do not be conformed to this world, or do not be conf do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One version says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing perfect will. Another version says that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What am I saying here? The purpose for being in God's house, the purpose for being God's house ourselves should be maintained. The Lord will revive us in that if we commune with him, if we keep the altar alive. So suggestion number one, I pray that we can maintain the purpose for God's house. The purpose for God's house. Let's maintain it. Many forces will come, all sorts of things, either dependent on whichever forces, forces of leadership or forces of uh, capitalism, whatever forces, whatever it is. But I pray that we will stand to maintain the purpose of God's house for which it is God's business. Suggestion number two, I have three suggestions. Suggestion number two is to maintain. The other one was the purpose of God. Number two is the dignity of God's house. To maintain the dignity of God's house. Remember when we said, when we read that the Lord will give us a name that will not be cut off. So when we said the dignity of God's house, the splendor of God's house in you, the splendor of God's house, to make that name of God unmatched, unmatched as me, Richard, as, as a child of God, unmatched, unmatched, unmatched. In physical terms, we talk about church buildings, which is why we are building this, the, the, which is why I'm passionate about SCP as a, as, as a project, as a building. Yes, it's to give God's name an unmatched presence in that particular location for that purpose, the splendor. But then, in spiritual terms, which is more important, the glory of God in your life, in my life, the glory of God in our fellowship, the glory of God in church, ought to be defended so that the name of the Lord, the dignity of God's house, remains. Suggestion number three is to constantly check the integrity of God's house in relation to God's purpose, in relation to the first two, in relation to God's purpose and God's dignity in us. Why do I talk about the integrity? Remember, I said, as an engineer, I know, and you also know that, any house built with human hands, I share, will, un will one time need repairs, renovation, whatever it is. So it wears out. And in my professional uh, world, we keep saying, what is the integrity of the structure? And so suggestion number three as a clause is that we'll constantly check the integrity of God's house. Remember I've said this God's house is either the corporate, together, family, but also me as an individual. Checking the integrity of God's house. Are you still God's temple? Am I still God's temple in whom? God's presence dwells, whether in public or private, is prayer and the word of God still the main thing. Are we able to still keep the main thing, the main thing? Valuable to keep your integrity check in check. Why? Because in the house of God, the intangible value is more important than the material wealth or even physical development that we witness. And so I ask again, are you due for renovation? My brother, are you due for remodeling? You looked at yourself as a house. Are you due for reconstruction? Even when I said, oh, for the last, you know, we, we testify. So for the last 50 years, I've been saved. For the last 20 years, I will bless the Lord for that, uh, for that commitment. Are we due for renovation? Are we due for remodeling? Are we due for reconstruction? Write down the scripture, First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. You yourselves, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house or a holy priesthood, 
to do what? To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are working progress, brethren. Let us keep on. We have encouragement in Proverbs 3, 5, and, uh, 5 to 6, Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 6, that if we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and we do not lean on our own understanding, we will make it. That in all our ways, let us acknowledge the Lord, he will make our path straight. That's an encouragement for us. And so, friends, it's a season of revival. It's a season of reflection. It's a season to grab the work of the Lord in God's house. God's house is you, is me. And so I pray that we'll be, we'll grab the opportunity to refurbish God's house. That means to reinstate functional design. When we say refurbishment, it means certain things are not functioning as they were intended to reinstate them. So I pray that we'll grab the moment, this revival time, to be refurbished, to be revitalized, revitalized to be realigned or returned to function. Sometimes we feel dead. Sometimes I feel challenged and dead in some areas. Or some people want to make you feel dead, but we can be revitalized. I pray that in this season of revival, we shall grab the opportunity to get cleansed. Our text today, the Lord Jesus cleansed the temple. Immediately he, went, he walked into Jerusalem. Even at the beginning of the ministry, he did. I pray to grab the opportunity to be cleansed. What is to cleanse? To remove foreign objects, the merchandise that intrudes and clogs functionality of systems. Houses have systems and so on. So functionality of systems can be clogged by this merchandise we bring in, like those people brought in the temple. And the Lord says, uh -uh, I'm removing it. In chapter 2 of John, he even used the whip to, to chase them out. May the Lord give us the grace to grab this opportunity to remove foreign objects that intrude. And remember I said we put walls in the house to keep out intrusion. We put doors and windows to keep out intrusion. And so as God's temple, we need to emulate the grace and holiness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we get concerned about bringing glory to his name as individuals, as families, as a church. Brethren, I pray that we'll remain in the house of God, that we ourselves, we will remain as the house of God. I said, we'll pray that we will remain in the house of God and that we ourselves will remain as the house of God and that we'll be able and always desirous, desiring to house God, house God. And so I pray this evening that we'll be blessed as that as God's house, prayer will be key to our lives, that will be revived, cracked foundations will be reconstructed, God's house will be refurbished, revitalized, and to God be the glory. Amen. 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 Amen, amen to the word that we have just received. Praise be to God. Please join me to thank Engineer Richard Mugisha, our brother, our brethren, for the word of God. Thank you, Engineer, for allowing God to use you. We have been immensely blessed by this word. And indeed, it is a season of revival, and this word has gone ahead to really revive us and challenge us. So we are going to have a prayer response. <laughs> Time is not. May God bless you for this word. Dear Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we are forever grateful to you and we are indebted to you for your goodness unto us, for your generosity, for your grace and mercies. We thank you for you love us and you, indeed you have good and beautiful plans for us 
Thank you for this beautiful word <clears throat> that we have just received by the power of the Holy Spirit through your son who has given us this word. May you bless Engineer Richard for accepting to be used as a vessel this evening, oh God. And Father, we have, we have heard, we have listened, we have been challenged. We are your temple. Lord, we pray, we repent first of all, where we have defiled your temple. Because we have learned our bodies at the temple of God. We pray that you forgive us. We pray that you cleanse us. May this word cleanse us, just like you entered the temple and you cleansed it. May you cleanse us with this word and forgive us where we have de defiled both the physical temple and the spiritual temple, which is our bodies. Forgive us and wash us clean with your blood. And Father, Lord God, we have learned your house is a house of prayer. We pray as All Saints Cathedral, Lord God, where we have not utilized your house purely for prayer, we pray that you will forgive us. And Lord, your temple will be purposely for prayer to bring glory to your name. And our bodies as well will be your house, you will use it for prayer and your presence will be in us, oh God. We will not defile ourselves because, Lord, we are your temple. You desire to reside in us. You, re you desire to do your work through us, oh God. So, Father, I pray that you will help us to offer ourselves to you, to offer our bodies to you as living sacrifices, as living sacrifices of God that glorify your name. King of glory, we thank you. And we pray against any intrusion. We pray against any interferences that comes from external forces or even our own thoughts, our own lifestyles, oh God. Whichever intrusions that defile your temple, Lord, we pray that we will deal with them today. We will refuse to be interfered with. We will refuse to be your temple to be intruded, oh God. And we will remain steady first, oh God, worshiping you and living for you, King of glory. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us a lifestyle of worship and obedience because that is how we remain your house. That is how we remain in your house, and that is how we will remain your house. Lord, help us to live a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of obedience, a lifestyle of repentance, oh God. And Father, may you help us to be transformed daily in your likeness, oh God, that we will not be like that house that needs to be demolished and be reconstructed. Father, I pray that we will not be demolished, but every day you will polish us up with your word, with your Holy Spirit, that Father, we will remain strong and firm on a steady foundation of your truth, that Lord, we will not need to be demolished, King of glory. Help us to remain steady first, Heavenly Father, Polish us and cleanse us every day with your word. We bless you, Heavenly Father. We worship you, King of glory, and we pray that we will remain in your original purpose, O oh God, because that is the reason you have established us as your church, as the body of Christ, that we will remain in your original purpose and we will remain serving your purpose, O oh God. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will keep us in there. That, Lord, we will maintain the dignity of your church, of your house, of your temple. That, Father, we will not be defiled. That, Lord, we will remain holy. We will remain humble at your feet, O Lord God, to be taught and to receive from you, King of glory. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless us as All Saints Cathedral in this time of revival, in this month of prayer. Father, I pray that we will finish well. I pray that we will be taught and by your word and we will remain humble and obedient to whatever you have to teach us, oh God. That Father, in our generation, we will be known that we built your house of dignity, both physical and spiritual. That Father, we left a mark for others that will come later. We bless your holy name, O oh God. We worship you. We pray that you will stay with us even as we go into next week, O oh God. We pray that you bless us and stay with us. In Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. Amen.